electrical lecture on our course. It's titled System on a Chip and Programmable System on a Chip. So basically this lecture is again an introduction to SOC design. So System on a Chip, uh, normally we call them SOCs. And SOCs and SOC based designs, they have become a major sub area within embedded system. That's why we are going to discuss this topic. And most of your, our labs will be based on SOC design. So SOCs, they are also integrated circuit ICs, uh, which looks similar to your processes or FPGA. But the difference is, uh, as the name indicates, each chip contains an entire system. Now, when we say entire system, uh, in this semester you will be seeing microcontroller and you will find the difference between our traditional microprocessors and microcontroller. You will find like microcontroller, they integrate more peripherals compared to a microprocessor. So inside a microcontroller, you will have a processor core. In addition to that, you usually have memory, volatile or non-volatile, RAMs and ROMs, as well as input-output control blocks, etc. Now, SOCs, they integrate much more than microcontroller. Okay, so let's look at a few examples. Uh, one of the most popular ones that you might have heard is the Snapdragon SOC, which is the most widely used mobile processor. So sometimes you will hear it as a mobile processor, sometimes you will uh, hear it as an SOC. Uh, actually it's an SOC. So if you look at the yeah. floor plan or the die of this SOC chip, so you can see it has processor inside. So these are the processors Cortex-A57 and A53. They are ARM based processors. In addition to processor you can see it has DDR memory here, it has separate core for multi media processing, it has separate core for display control, it has a USB controller, again separate display engine and it also has a GPU inside the same chip and it also has the modem for controlling your mobile communication. So you'll see the entire system is within a single chip. Okay? And another widely popular SOC is the Apple A12 chip, Apple Bionic, you might have heard it. Because this SOC, in addition to the processor, here you have six cores in total. There are four core GPUs also, and you also have uh, something called a neural engine, which is uh, neuromorphic computing. So eight cores of neuromorphic computing engine also. So that's why we call it a bionic chip also. It also has a memory controller, and what is the remaining of the chip? we are yet to find out so this is done by people who are f opening chips and uh, finding out what, what things are inside the chip because Apple they officially don't release this information. Uh, another popular SOC is Exynos or which is becoming popular this is an SOC from Samsung and they are using this chip in their uh, low to middle order mobiles so architecture is quite similar so it has multi cores here a57 these are arm processor a57 processor and there are a53 processor in addition to that it has all kind of peripheral i2c spi timing control uh, display control all other peripherals so again this is an soc you have the camera controller here so all the peripherals in the system they are integrated inside a single chip so that's why we call them system on a chip. Now, there are certain advantages and disadvantages of SOC. So, of course, uh, one of the major advantage is uh, saving space because you have a single chip which uh, integrates all the peripherals. So, the overall area required for the system is much smaller, which makes sense when you go for mobile technology. You want your phone to be very slim, very small, sleek. So, we need to use SOCs. And since uh, all these systems are on the same chip power consumption is much less so if you look at any computing platform the most of the power is consumed for interchip communication when data transfer happen between the chips uh, they have to dry high current which uh, consume a lot of power now here all the peripherals are inside the same chip because of that there is no or very low interchip communication so the power consumption is less and performance is usually quite high again because all the circuitry is in the same chip so 
it can run at very high clock frequency so the clock frequency and throughput they are usually high cost is lower again because of high level of integration it is better to buy a single soc with all these peripherals integrated rather than multiple chips uh, each for each functionality so the overall cost will come down reliability is again higher the integrating multiple chips and the security because everything is inside the same chip the probability of people hacking during interchip communication or side channel attacks the chances are lower the, those are the main advantages of soc but it comes with some of the disadvantages also one major issue is a single point of failure even if you if you um, damage a small portion of this soc you will have to replace the enter chip if you are using separate chip for building the entry system if one chip goes bad you have to replace only that chip but here even if you damage one small portion you will have to replace the enter chip so that makes it a single point of failure another issue is the high initial investment yeah, okay so it's again uh, a high level of integration so the initial design and manufacturing costs it's quite high actually and again because of it's a very complex circuit very complex chip the time and investment on verification and testing is much higher than going for discrete implementation now this is a typical design flow for soc it uh, basically involves development of the soc as well as the programming of the soc so you can see on the left side we have a hardware subsection going and on the right side we have a software so the socs again plays a major role in so called the hardware software co design approach that means your system contains both hardware and software and they are not developed completely independent they run in parallel and we have certain checkpoints where we make sure there is proper coordination between the hardware development and the software development which we call as hardware software co code and we'll learn more about it in the course as we go forward so again i'm not going to explain each and every step uh, because we'll be practically doing most of them so basically you will have hardware design hardware simulation prototyping then software design, software testing, application software, then the integration and final testing. So in this particular course, we are not going to build our own SOC. Of course, in a university environment, that's not possible. We are going to use a special kind of SOC and we will not be going for production of our custom SOC. Okay? So we'll be concentrating on this portion. So we'll be doing both hardware part as well as software part. Okay, only this much. Now again, when we talk about SOC, there are two kinds of SOC. So I am calling the first type as the traditional SOC, and these are similar to our ASIC. And on these SOCs, the circuit inside the SOC is burnt or implemented at the time of manufacturing itself. So all the SOCs I mentioned before, the Snapdragon or Apple Bionic, they are all traditional SOCs. You cannot change the circuitry inside the SOC. Now that doesn't mean these SOCs are not reprogrammable. You can of course reprogram by using software. So you already have the circuit, you already have processors, GPU, you can control them with the help of software. Now they have certain advantages, specifically their throughput is quite high and the power consumption is less. The disadvantages are if you if you want any modification to the circuitry, okay, if you want to do some upgrade, you will have to uh, redesign the entire chip, you will have to go through the entire uh, testing phase again, which may be quite expensive. Now, these kind of chips, they make sense when we go for large production. So the arguments are similar between the development of ASIC and the development of FPGA. Where ASIC makes sense, where FPGA makes sense, uh, similar arguments. So traditional SOCs, they make sense if you are going for mass production. Now, if you are not going for mass production, if you need SOCs for small scale application, then it makes sense to go for so-called programmable SOC. Okay? In programmable SOC, 
The part of an SOC or part of the IC is pre-built such as the processor core and the remaining portion of the chip can be used by the consumer or end user to implement his own circuit. Okay. So that's why we call it uh, call them as uh, programmable SOC. And usually the part of the SOC which can be programmed by the user is an FPGA fabric. So you have one chip and inside this single chip you have part of the chip which is fixed which cannot be modified and you have part of the chip which can be modified and the part which can be modified they will have the FPGA architecture which we discussed in the last lecture. So there are again uh, advantages and disadvantages exactly same as the comparison between ASICs and FPGA. So usually their performance is slightly lower but from uh, development time point of view or from risk point of view it makes sense to go for PSOCs or programmed SOC when you need uh, small scale production. Now <coughs> when we go with uh, SOC design in general or with PSOC the, the current trend is to use so called IPs for designing your system. So in, in IC design, the term IP stands for intellectual properties, not our internet protocol. Okay, so the idea here is similar to software development. So you might have seen in uh, software development, you, you do a lot of code reuse. You'll be using the code written by other people. You may have either access to the source code or you may have access to pre-compiled library. In any way, you, you don't have to rewrite the code. You can reuse the code written by other people or the code written by yourself in the past. The major advantage here is during the testing phase because this part of the code is proven code. You don't have to test it again. So that saves a lot of time. So following the same concept here, the idea is you, you reuse the hardware either developed by yourself or developed by third parties and we call these hardware modules or hardware blocks as uh, IPs, hardware IPs and they usually come in three flavors. First one is called hard IP. So hard IPs are basically IPs which are built into the chip. So you can use that hardware block but you cannot change that hardware block. So a good example is the processor core inside an SOC or the process core inside a piece of program SOC, they come as hard IP. So you cannot modify them, you can just use them. Next one is called a soft IP. In this case, the IP developer, he'll be giving you the source code in VHD or Weightlog or one of the hardware description languages and you can use that code directly using your development, your system development. Okay. You can integrate their code with your custom code and you can build the end session. That's what we call as a soft IP. And the third category is called uh, firm IP. Again, this is similar to using the compiled source code in software. Here you won't have direct access to HDL language. Instead, they will be providing you a netlist. You have seen netlist in last semester. So you'll be giving netlist in edit format or one of the custom at least format, which uh, you cannot decode and find out what is actually happening, but the implementation tool can understand what this netlist is describing and it will be able to interface this particular uh, netlist with your custom code. So provided you have the netlist and you know what are the inputs and outputs from this particular IP. So in our course, we will be extensively using this IP-based uh, development flow. Now, let's discuss about signing sync. So, signing sync it is a very popular piece of programmable SOC, and for our course, we'll be using this particular chip. So, signings they call them Zinc a PSOC or programmable system on chip which is basically a system on chip so it's an integrated circuit which looks like this now to use it we need a development board also so the development board that we are going to use is called Z board so this is the board and you can see 
this particular SOC is sitting here. In addition to that, there are a lot of peripherals here available. Again, I'll be explaining them later in another lecture, the Z development board. So just keep in mind the term zinc, zinc SOC, or in, in some cases you will also find in literature they are called hybrid FPGAs. So it has an FPGA inside as well as a processor code. Okay, so that's why we call them hybrid. Now let's look at the architecture of zinc in a bit more detail. So this is what is inside the chip. Okay, bird's eye view. The chip is mainly divided into two parts. So the blue color here, that is actually a built-in processor, processor cores. Okay. It is a hard IP, that means you cannot change this portion of the chip. And this portion of the chip is called processing system, or we always refer it as PS. So whenever you hear PS, remember it stands for processing system. It is a part of the zinc chip. It is a hard IP. It contains processor and you cannot change the circuit in this part. But of course, you will be able to program this processor. Now the remainder of the chip, this big area, it is called programmable logic or PL. Okay, sorry. There is a typo here. I will correct it. This part is called PL, programmable logic and it is basically an FPGA fabric or it follows the architecture of an FPGA. So you can build any digital circuit that you wish in this portion of the chip. And you will see there are some interface between PS and PL and these interfaces follow so called the AXI standard, Advanced Extensible Interface Standard which is a standard developed by ARM for communicating between microcontrollers and peripherals. Again, details we will discuss, but the main takeaway is you have PS here, you have PL here, this part you cannot change, the hardware you cannot change, but you can program the processor in this part, and this part you can implement any custom hardware, digital hardware that you want, and PS can communicate with the hardware in PL through these interfaces, through the XC interface. This is a little bit more details. It's exactly what I mentioned. So you have PS here. Inside PS you have processor. There are other peripherals also. It also has built-in memory inside this PS portion. And this processor can run your uh, 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 simple operating system. It can actually run uh, Linux kernel also. It can run application we will be writing in lab, in C or C++ we will write, and hardware drivers also, all those things will be running in the processor. In the PL part, you have your custom peripherals sitting here, and the processor can communicate with these custom peripherals through this X interface. Now this is a comparison between Zinc implementation and other way you can develop your system. You can either go for ASIC, you of course know what it is, Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Uh, ASSP stands for Application Specific Standard Processor. So again, this is uh, another technique of developing custom solution. Here what you do is you develop a processor and it has instructions. So we have seen in the computer architecture course, every processor has a set of instruction set. So in ASSP, you will develop instructions specific for the particular application for which this processor is targeted for. So if you are developing a processor for image processing, you will have special instruction. Uh, for example, you can have a, a instruction for multiply and accumulate. Okay, Or you can have a special instruction for RGB to grayscale conversion. Okay. So we have specific instruction for that specific application. That is what ASSP. And two chip solution, uh, you build your circuit using multiple chips, discrete or you go for zinc. What are the advantages and disadvantages it's showing? Uh, it seems like uh, it's better to go with zinc in, in most cases. Again, this slide is taken from Xilinx, uh, who is the manufacturer of zinc. So 
take it with a sort of pinch again. But of course, the risk factor, it makes sense. The risk is much less when you go for SOC, a uh, programmable SOC, and the time to market is also quite less. It's flexible and it is scalable. But again, let me repeat, the major drawback will be the size of the circuit that you can implement within the zinc chip. So it is limited by how much resources, how much CLPs, how much lookup table, how much flip-flops are available within the chip. That restricts how big your circuit can be within this chip. So if you look at the circuitry inside a Snapdragon or Apple Bionic, it is so complex that you may not be able to fit all the circuits inside a zinc chip. Okay, so that's the major disadvantage. Now again, slide from Xilinx, what are the major highlights of Zinc? And uh, as I mentioned before, it has processor inside. These are ARM processor actually, so it has a dual core um, Cortex A9 processor. Okay, and it has a lot of other peripherals also in the PS part, and it is tightly integrated with PL. Uh, it has a flexible array of IO. Uh, this is a uh, closer view of the PS part of Zinc. Okay, so this is an expanded view of this portion PS. And again, you don't have don't have to remember the details, but good to know that the PS part it has two ARM processors. So you can see ARM Cortex A9 here, ARM Cortex A9 here. So it has two processor core Cortex A9, and they have their own cache memory separate. Each processor has a dedicated FPU, stands for floating point unit. These are special, special circuits which are used for doing floating point arithmetic. So, you know, floating point in IEEE representation, they are much complex. So, there is dedicated hardware for processing those numbers. <coughs> it also has memory controller. You can see it has DDL, PDDL memory controller, and you can put external memory to the chip. It has on chip memory. In addition to that on-chip memory, you can expand the memory by adding external chip and these are the controllers for the external chip. Uh, here you can see a bunch of peripherals again available. There are two USB controller, two Ethernet controller, GPIO, UART controller, CAN controller, I2C controller, SPA controller. So these different communication standard you will be covering in the embedded lecture what is SPA, I2C, CAN, UART, etc. Basically these are all used for communicating with other peripherals outside the chip. Okay, so for the time being that is enough. This is the view of the PL. So here you can see there is a gap here. This is where PS is sitting. Remaining portion is PL and the architecture is exactly an FPGA architecture. So there are CLBs sitting here, there are switch boxes sitting here, and you can build any hardware in, in PL by, by following what we discussed in the first lecture. Now, in addition to CLBs, modern FPGAs, <coughs> they have two more basic building blocks, actually, which I skipped in the first lecture. They are block ramps and DSP slices. So block RAMs, they are very small memory blocks. Okay, they are small RAM. Their capacity is usually uh, four kilobits or nine kilobits. Very small. Uh, DSP, they are dedicated multipliers. So if you want to build small memories or multiplier circuit inside an FPGA, usually we won't use CLPs because you will have to use a lot of CLPs to make a memory. Instead of that, it can use these small memory units and combine them to build a larger memory. We'll be doing it in lab. Similarly, if you want to build multipliers inside an FPGA, we won't be using CLBs to implement the multiplier. We'll be usually using, or, or rather the software tool that we are going to use, it will be using these DSP slices to implement them. So of course, you can use CLBs to implement memory as well as multiplier but it is more efficient to use block ramps and DSP slices to do it. 
Now this is uh, again you have seen this slide in the previous lecture. This is the floor plan or the die of an actual zinc. So you can see what is inside the chip. So this big black area, this is the PS where the processor and the peripherals are sitting. And this large area, it is the PL which is an FPGA fabric. And these two portions, they are interfaced through uh, so-called the AXI interface so that they can communicate with each other. Now, there are three different use cases where you can use zinc. So in the first case, you can use only the PS part of the zinc and you can have a pure software implementation of the system. Uh, you are not going to use your own custom hardware. Okay, So you are not going to touch the PL part. You use the ARM pro processes inside the PS part. Now it doesn't make much sense because zinc costs a few hundred dollars. If you want to implement something purely in software, you can buy microprocessors or microcontroller very, very cheap, maybe for five or ten dollar you can buy a good microprocessor so no need to go for zinc. Second case is you can use only the PL part of zinc and implement your custom hardware and don't touch the PS part. That means your system is purely custom hardware based, purely hardware based. Now again this doesn't make much sense. If you want pure hardware implementation you can just go and buy an FPGA uh, or traditional FPGA which is much cheaper than zinc. Okay. And the third scenario is your system is composed of both software as well as hardware. So you have some software in your system running in a processor and you have some custom hardware. Okay. So the software can be implemented in the PS part and the hardware can be implemented in PL part and they can communicate with each other. And this is the scenario which actually makes sense. So zinc is again used in, in cases where your system is composed of both software and hardware. That's why it is quite popular in software hardware core design approaches. Okay, that's all in this lecture. We will have more details in the next lecture.